Uh, old friends, and welcome to another video. Uh, hope you had a good weekend. So, um, I'm going to. So, we just finished um, chapter, what is it? Chapter Fields, chapter 21. Uh, it has one section, 21.3, which is, I mean, really awesome. Um, it's about storage and compass com constructions and how you can solve how. In the 1800s, you could solve uh, problems using field theory that were unknown for 2,000 years. But uh, there's not, not many days of class left. And honestly, everything that's left is very cool. So I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> I'm just going to move on to, to find a field, uh, which is chapter 22. So the goal of this chapter is to list all the all the fields that have a finite number of elements. Um, so finite finite here means a finite set. Which is a field. Um, so you know a ton of those since you're since you were toddlers. <laughs> um, you know zp for every prime and then there were like 20 or so years of your life where you didn't learn about any more fields or maybe a couple i don't know i don't know when you learned what a field was um and then a couple of weeks ago or a month ago we we learned how to construct new fields by attaching roots to existing fields roots of polynomials and we saw we saw fields of order four four nine twenty five i think 49 maybe, 27. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to tell you the punchline that we're heading towards probably Wednesday. Uh, for every prime power, there is just one field. Of, of with um, with p to the n elements. Of course, up to isomorphism. So essentially, um, we can talk about the field with sixty four elements, and indeed, that's how everyone talks. Um, and there's no fields. With a different sizes, there are no fields of order six, but that's going to be that's much easier to show. Um, actually, we know a lot of fields. Um, it's going to make our life um, it's going to make uh, our life much much easier. Um, so today we're just going to prepare for that. Um, show um, show some things about. Um, Find a field. So the first thing, so the first thing that happens to find a field is that they they definitely don't have characteristic zero. When you take a finite field and you start adding ones together, uh, you so you take one, one plus one, one, two, three, four, five, six, it has finitely elements. So eventually you start repeating. Um, and that means, um, well, if you have, right. and if you have finite field, take one, one plus one, well, I mean, this is called two, right? Three, four, five. Um, <clears throat> Eventually, n equals n because if these were all different numbers, uh, different elements of the field, we would have uh, infinitely many. Uh, and if you have that n equals m, surely you have that n minus m is zero. So there's some some number uh, 
some some let me, let me say n times one one repeated a number of times is zero um and let me remind you that the smallest n well natural number such that n times one is zero is called the characteristic of n of, of f of the field. And let me remind you the characteristic is always a prime number. Um, and we write it char. So if char f is not zero, meaning you start adding once and you eventually get zero, um, then <clears throat> uh, it's a prime. All right, so uh, this is very easy to prove. Let n be the characteristic of the field. If n is a times b, uh, well, this means that but what would this mean? n being the characteristic of the field means that n times 1. So one added to itself n times is zero. Uh, here I mean one plus one plus one n times. So what happens when n is a relative to numbers? What well, uh, if you have n once in a row, if you have six once in a row and six is two times three, and that means that you can write uh, the six ones in a rectangle of three rows and two columns or something. Uh, in other words, this is a times one times b times one. And, and this must be zero. So by a times one, again, I'm, I mean adding one to itself n times, adding one to itself b times, of course. So now I have a product of two things which equals zero. So one of them has to be zero. And oh, am I really going to need one more line? All right, I guess, I guess so. <clears throat> um, one of the factors of, of the characteristic is zero, but the characteristic is not just any number. Um, it's the smallest number for which um, is the most natural number, which is zero in this field. So if n is the smallest number of ones that makes a zero, but I know that a or, or b make a zero, if a makes a zero, that means that a is at least n. And since a and b are the, the factors of n, uh, that means that they're just equal. So we showed that whenever you factor n, you get that one of the factors is n. Uh, so n is a prime. All right. So if you find yourself in a ring and uh, adding one six times, um, adding one six times gives you zero, uh, that means that and, and adding, to, adding adding it two or three it doesn't give you zero. That means that it's not a field because two times three is zero, and neither two nor three is zero.
All right, this is just, I mean, I didn't even use that it's a, a field. I only use that it's a domain. I use that the product of two things uh, can only be zero when one of them is zero. All right, so, so finite fields have characteristic, which is a prime number. Um, so let's show the first promise I made. Um, if F is a finite field of characteristic P, it has P to the N elements for some, um, so it has the, the number of elements is a power of P for some prime, or for some uh, power. <clears throat> so, let's prove this. Uh, so we will know for sure that there are no uh, fields of, or, or there are six or 10 or, I don't know, 12. Um, so every ring has a homomorphism from uh, from Z. It just where you you know you send the sum of ones to a sum of ones and the sum of negative ones to a sum of negative ones. Um the kernel. So what do, what do I call this? Uh phi. The kernel of phi is is the set of natural numbers such that n is zero in F. Uh so when do you get um when when do you add once and get zero in F when when you add as many ones as the characteristic or a multiple of that? So this is uh, P times Z. N equals zero. Exactly when P divides and no, I shouldn't call it N, should I? M. The only the only way to get a zero in in z mod five is if you add one a multiple of five times. So by the first isomorphism theorem, for any homomorphism, z mod the kernel is isomorphic to the image. Um, so z mod the kernel. We just said it's Z P, and and the image, um, the image is whatever it is, but it's it's the it's a it's a sub ring of F, it's a subfield. So, any field of characteristic P, really, I didn't use that. It's finite. Yeah, um, any field of characteristic P uh, contains Z P. That's that's what we just proved. Let me write it down. And for a similar reason, any field of characteristic zero contains the rationals. And of course, it's a it's a field extension because this is a field containing another field. So, I mean, already you know that every what every finite field looks like. It looks like attaching roots of a polynomial um, to to Z P uh, because we know so much about fields already. So, 
if the characteristic of f is p, f contains, I'm just going to write f contains zp because it's just something isomorphic to zp. We're just going to say it's, it's zp. It's the sums of ones. Um, so now, now we're going to use my favorite thing to use about fields, which is linear algebra. Um, so these are just two fields containing each other. Um, F is a vector space over the finite field of order P. I guess I also just shown that any field of size P is this field, uh, but I think you already knew that. So um, what is the best thing about vector spaces? Is its basis. Um, so, if f is finite, and here I just mean a finite set, certainly it's finitely generated because anything finite is finitely generated in, in any, any sort of algebraic structure you look at it as groups, as rings, as vector spaces, whatever, just generated by taking all its elements. Um, so, What's the generating set for f? Just f. Um, that's always true for any f, whether it's finite or not. But if f happens to be finite, well, there's a finite, finite generating set. Uh, and now we have the linear algebra fact that you take a generating set, you start removing elements and removing dependent elements, you eventually get a basis. Especially if it's finite, then I'm really sure you only need a finite number of steps to do this. A finite basis. So um, let let me just call it um, what alpha one through alpha n. So it has dimension n. So f every element of f is a unique linear combination of this basis with coefficients in the finite field of order p, uh, which as vector spaces, I'm just saying is the vector space you know, of what you usually call vectors, just tuples of numbers. So these are isomorphic vector spaces, but in particular, they're uh, bijective. So how many ways are there to choose? Um, and elements in ZP, well, there's P choices, there's P elements. And you make n many choices. So if p is three, there's three for the first number, three for the second, three for the third, and then to compute the total, you just multiply. So uh, so f has f has p to the n elements just because it's a vector space. So. There's no field of order 20, of size 20. <clears throat> All right, so that's already part of the, the promise. So um, I'm going to show now. So, All right, so I'm just going to show a few separate things about. So, so let me show you another thing about characteristic P, um, which I think you've already seen, but let me remind you. This is called the freshman stream um, for obvious reasons. Um, freshman stream is that if S is a 
field of characteristic P, then when you add and take a piece power, that's the same as taking piece powers and adding. Especially, this is especially wonderful when P is two. And you don't, when P is two, I mean, the reason this is true is that you're missing a two AB there. But if, if the characteristic is two, two AB is just zero AB. Um, and if you can take a piece power and do this, that just means that, that you can you can do this as many times you like if you can do it once. You take p powers n times, you get a p to the nth power. <clears throat> All right, so I mean I'm gonna prove it, but let me just show you what happens if p is two. What I just said. A plus b squared is a squared plus two a b plus b squared, uh, which is a squared plus b squared, because two equals zero. And the thing is, the binomial theorem gives you some sort of mess there when you um, when you take the piece power of a plus b, but all the stuff in between that you wouldn't want is just a multiple of p. So. The proof goes like this. Um, use the binomial theorem, which is nothing other than just foiling and foiling and foiling, which is my least favorite concept in all of mathematics, probably, because why would you have a mnemonic rule for something that makes sense? Um, just to make it seem like it doesn't make sense. So um, make an mnemonic for the binomial theorem. That's what you should do. I'm not saying the reason it makes sense is the binomial theorem. The reason it makes sense is the distributive law. Right? You have a plus b, a plus b, a plus b. You gotta multiply the multiply in every possible way. Um, because that's what the associative law tells you to do. And then you count how many times you've multiplied i, a's, and j, b's, and that's going to be p choose i. Anyway. Um, look up the binomial theorem if you don't remember why it's true or ask me in office hours. So you have all the all the possible powers that add up to uh, that add up to p, and the the jth term is next to the binomial coefficient p choose j. This is the, um, the rows of Pascal's triangle also, um, where you write a one and then you add the two numbers above to get the, to get the next row. Well, yeah, the fifth row has all multiples of five. So um, B choose J has a formula. Um, which is uh, this factorials. Um, this means you take p, p minus one, and you multiply every number until you get to one. And the factorial in the denominator also means this. You multiply all the numbers from one to where you are. So if you stare at this fraction, this has a p. The numerator has a p. Um, and here, if j is smaller than p and p minus j is smaller than p, so if j is bigger than 0, then nothing divides p.
if if b is prime. <clears throat> nothing. Uh, nothing is a multiple of b. Sorry. Well, it's also to nothing divides b. So nothing is a multiple of b. If you multiply a bunch of numbers which are not multiples of b, um, and p is a prime, you don't get any any p factors. Um, so that's why I'm using that p is a prime. So if the numerator is a multiple of p and the denominator is not, then the whole fraction is a multiple of p. So if j is not zero or p, in which case the binomial coefficient is one, this fraction is a multiple of p. So a plus b to the p which is the sum of p choose j which is the sum of all of these terms um, is just a to the p plus zero plus zero plus zero all of the coefficients that show up in between are zero it's just like in the case of uh, p equals two And that's it. So, so that's half of the statement, the half about the p's power. Um, if you now take the p to the nth power, well, what you do is just, it's the p's power done n times. So for example, you could do it by induction. If I have a smaller n, my induction is just a fancy way of saying, keep doing it until you're done. Apply induction to the to the inside of this piece power, it will tell you that p to the n minus one um, commutes with sums. And now I'm left with a piece power. Uh, oh, and, and then I just use the, the rules of powers. All right, so um, we learned some things about, um, about finite fields and Wednesday, Wednesday we will prove the theorem, pretty sure. All right, have a good one. Um, subscribe or something. <laughs>